All right, good evening, everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. And tonight I am talking about cervicogenic dizziness. We did a talk on Wednesday night, just in general, discussing what I do in the winter months. And from that, I asked uh, a lot of our listeners for any questions they may have pertaining to their conditions. So tonight we're starting off with cervicogenic dizziness and how misalignments of the C1 and C2 cervical vertebra, that's the top two vertebra in your neck, how that may impact dizziness. So that's what we're talking about. So let me go to, do, 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 to the slide that we're going to present from beginning. And here we go. So relative to this whole concept of how your neck can interplay with dizziness is pretty interesting. I will say for good balance function and for us not to feel dizzy, we want to have good information, sensory information coming from our eyes, our inner ear, our neck, and our feet. So there's something called multisensory dizziness. You see this typically in older individuals where they start to have macular degeneration, so they start to have abnormal visual inputs, they develop peripheral neuropathy where they stop feeling their feet as well, and then they may have had Meniere's disease or they had some sort of vestibular hypofunction issue. So literally their main sensory symptoms that tell their brain where they are relative to their surroundings go south. As a consequence, they don't really know where their body is at relative to their surroundings, so they start to feel dizzy. So that's multisensory dizziness. Relative to other forms of vertigo and dizziness I've talked about extensively, whether it be vestibular neuronitis or BPPV or Meniere's disease, when we have an abnormal sensory input from the inner ear, it makes logical sense that we're going to have dizziness. Yet, if we have something like a cervical vertebra, quote unquote, out of place, what impact is that going to have? on dizziness, or if you have dizziness, what impact is that going to have? Also, why is that cervical vertebra out of place, which is the functional neurology perspective? That's the other piece of it. So a lot of it depends on your history. If we take an example for, for example, if we use the example of a concussion patient, Lots of times patients who are concussed have a whiplash injury as well as a component to their injury. So if you've had a whiplash injury and then there's dizziness afterwards, your dizziness may be due to the effects of the concussion on your brain or the dizziness may have a, have a relation to a relationship to a vertebra in your neck or multiple vertebras not sending the same signals that they normally would. Now, how do vertebras send signals? To be exact, you have these receptors within the joints of your cervical spine called joint mechanoreceptors. And joint mechanoreceptors tell the nervous system where each vertebra is relative to a starting position. And then as you move, it's going to transduce signal telling your nervous system, hey, this vertebra is moving forward to the right, as an example. If a vertebra is out of place in the chiropractic world, they're going to refer to that as what is called a subluxation. A subluxation, as it's termed most commonly in the world of chiropractic, is different from a subluxation in medicine. A subluxation in medicine typically refers more to something that's almost dislocated. So I think that those semantics are important for you all to understand. And, um, and for my chiropractic brethren, you know, they work with subluxations all the time. And subluxations are real because vertebra can move. They can be relatively misaligned relative to one another. And when that happens, that can lead to abnormal input or let's say abnormal signal transduction for the joint mechanoreceptors, which can lead to things like pain or muscles not firing correctly to stabilize the spine or abnormal inputs into the brainstem and the cerebellum. Your first three, I believe, maybe it's the first two segments of your cervical spine, have 
monosynaptic connections. So from the joint mechanoreceptors, there can be monosynaptic connections into the cerebellum. So there is a very, very direct relationship there. Also know that there is somatosensory input, meaning your muscles have receptors and your, you have joint mechanoreceptors in your toes. Your entire soma or your body is feeling information into your cerebellum almost all the time, especially when you're upright and you're walking and you're moving and things of that nature. Furthermore, most of the muscle spindle receptors are in your suboccipital musculature or upper cervical musculature. So you have these little obliquus capitis muscles and rectus capitis muscles right here connecting your skull to the first one or two cervical vertebra and most of the receptors, or let's say it this way, the muscles with the highest receptor density are right here at the base of your skull on the top of your neck. So there's a lot of chance for impacting the cerebellum through a manual therapy or chiropractic adjustment therapy to the upper cervical spine. And that's where I hope that you'll understand this chicken or the egg or egg or the chicken uh, description I'm trying to give to you. Because with cervicogenic dizziness, how to diagnose cervicogenic dizziness, that's a slide that's up here. Um, basically, they'll say at present, if you read on the far right of the screen, cervicogenic dizziness, that's CGD, is a diagnosis of exclusion. A diagnosis of exclusion exists in situations where no single test is able to diagnose the condition. And the diagnosis cannot be verified by outcomes, imaging, laboratory values, or unique signs or, and or symptoms. So that makes this entity kind of difficult. Um, so, for example, if you have Meniere's disease, even though there's nuances now, is it Meniere's disease or vestibular migraines causing what we think is Meniere's disease? Meniere's disease has a fairly set in stone diagnostic classification. Even now with MR imaging, I think in the next five years, you're going to see most Meniere's patients having MRIs of their vestibular labyrinth and with the commonality of 3T MRI imaging, we're going to be able to say, yes, you do have Meniere's for sure. Or no, this looks more like vestibular migraines. Uh, if you have vestibular neuritis or neuronitis, then there are certain ways doing caloric testing to objectify that you know, the vestibular nerve has been damaged, the superior vestibular nerve has been damaged with head thrust testing and things like that. BPPV is very easy to characterize. The one area I would say that's a little ambiguous would probably be PPPD versus cervicogenic dizziness because PPP, PPPD patients, uh, lots of times they have an anxiety component uh, associated with their condition. They tend to feel like they're moving, particularly with motion versus MDDS and or vestibular migraine patients tend to feel like they're rocking and bobbing at rest and they feel better at motion with motion. So cervicogenic dizziness is typically diagnosed when there's dizziness and neck pain and or neck stiffness. Now with that, I have some qualms with that. My qualms are that, you know, lots of times the neck is going to be stiff when there is a functional processing issue within the cerebellum and the brainstem networks involving the vestibular nuclei. So I, this is a functional neurology opinion, but I will say I've seen a lot of cases where people have dizziness and if they're given appropriate eye movement exercises and maybe they have food intolerances, which are creating antibodies to their cerebellum, and we correct those and we give them the proper vestibular rehabilitative exercises, not only, not only does their dizziness go away, but their neck stiffness can go away. Compare and contrast that with a chiropractor doing upper cervical manipulation or a physiotherapist, physical therapist who does manual therapy. And they're going to say, well, I'm going to take that patient who has dizziness and neck stiffness and I did an adjustment to their neck. I did a manual therapy to their neck and their dizziness went away. So what is what? And that's where, is it chicken or the egg, vice versa? So from that, I guess what I'm trying to say is that we can have what are referred to as compensations. Your neck may be tight because your brainstem and cerebellum are not computing accurately where 
you are relative to your surroundings. Maybe one side of your vestigial nucleus is weak. And because of that, you're going to have abnormal neck torsion, abnormal neck cervical spinal muscle activity as a result. Or maybe your cerebellum is not functioning as well because your cervical vertebra are not transducing the signals through the joint mechanoreceptors as well. So that's my take on cervicogenic dizziness. So I can't give you a, a solid answer saying, yes, anyone with dizziness and neck stiffness, they need to have their neck worked on. And I can't say no, that cervicogenic dizziness does not exist. I'm not going to say that either. I'm just letting you know that it's a complicated problem. And you know, as they say here, the cervical spine may be considered the cause of dizziness when all other potential causes of dizziness are excluded. To be considered, cervicogenic dizziness should be closely related to changes in cervical spine position and or cervical joint movement. So with that, you know, they're coming up with different tests where you can do a, a pursuit test, for example, if I were to turn the chair, excuse me for the camera shaking, turn the chair, turn my head, and then I do what for those of you who've had VNG testing, a pursuit test done where you know you have a target moving back and forth and you're supposed to track that target. You have all these other cervical head position tests where they you know have you turn your head and you're in the dark and you have a laser and you try to figure out where your head is and they try to say, okay, well, your perception of where your head is that is abnormal. Those are the tests being used, but there's not one definitive test. And the other slippery slope is that other medical conditions can cause neck stiffness and dizziness, like a vertebral artery dissection. So uh, sometimes people have vertebral artery strokes, and that can manifest this way. But that's the reason why doctors order MRIs of the brain to rule those things out. So my answer is, is that yes, C1 and C2 being out of place can create dizziness and also, if you have a brainstem and or cerebellar functional abnormality, that can cause your neck to feel stiff. And you're going to see some degree of neck stiffness with other conditions like vestibular migraines. And I've seen MDDS patients have neck stiffness. And I've seen PPPD, PPPD patients have neck stiffness. So that's my answer. All right. So hello to any, everyone who joined. Hey, hey. Hope you're all having fun, having a great Friday night. Hi, hi to everyone all over Nevada who joined. So thank you so much. Send me any questions you have. Um, really trying to do videos now on what you guys want to hear about. As I mentioned Wednesday night, uh, I've done a lot of videos recently, like series where I talk at length about everything relating to dizziness or everything at length relating to concussions or POTS or depression and anxiety. So now I'm trying to touch on what you want to hear about. So I'm probably going to talk about, I think it's brain inflammation and OCD coming up soon, but send me your feedback, any esoteric conditions or esoteric topics you want me to delve into, I will happily do so. Okay. Have a lovely evening.